A very good evening aspirants. I welcome you all to the Hindu daily news analysis brought to you by Shankar Ayas Academy. Today I am going to cover important news articles from the Hindu newspapers dated 29th and 30th of June 2023. Displayed here are the list of news articles that we will be discussing today. You can go through it. At the end of the video we will also have prelims practice question discussions. So try to watch the entire video and a kind request to you all those who haven't it subscribe to our youtube channel do subscribe and hit the bell icon button so that you will get regular notifications about our current affairs videos now let's get into our first news article discussion take a look at this news article from yesterday's newspaper this news article is speaking about national research foundation bill 2023 this is in news because Recently, the Union Cabinet, headed by our Prime Minister, approved the National Research Foundation Bill 2023. And this is about the news. Now, in this discussion, let us see some important provisions of National Research Foundation Bill 2023. First of all, know that the National Education Policy 2020 recommended the creation of National Research Foundation. So, it is based on this recommendation, the Union Cabinet approved the National Research Foundation Bill 2023. Once the bill is passed by the Parliament and if it gets President's assent, the National Research Foundation will be created as a separate body. Apart from this, the new law will repeal the Science and Engineering Research Board established by Parliament in 2008. So, the erstwhile Science and Engineering Research Board now will be subsumed into the National Research Foundation. Now, coming to the funding pattern, see over the next five years, that is between 2023 to 2028, the government is planning to spend rupees 50,000 crore for this National Research Foundation body. Of the rupees 50,000 crore, the government plans to raise rupees 36,000 crore through investments from industries and philanthropists. The central government, for its part, will provide rupees 10,000 crore, and the balance 4,000 crore will be raised by subsuming science and engineering research board into the national research foundation here you may have a question what does the government seek to achieve by establishing this national research foundation now moving forward we will see what are the objectives behind establishing this national research foundation the first and foremost thing is that the national research foundation will provide high level strategic direction to scientific research in the country to put it in simple words the national research foundation will decide what kind of research will receive funding in our country. Secondly, the National Research Foundation will seed, grow and promote research and development in our country. Thirdly, the National Research Foundation will foster a culture of research and innovation in India's universities, colleges, research institutions and R&D laboratories. Fourthly, the National Research Foundation will ensure equitable allocation of research funding. See, currently India's premier institutions like IITs and Indian Institute of Sciences get a bulk of research funding but state universities get very little so the national research foundation will address this anomaly and ensure equitable access to government funding for research fifthly the national research foundation will aid in increasing private sector funding for research and development in india see the current legal system in india makes it hard for private research organizations to contribute to a funding body such as the national research foundation the National Research Foundation Bill will address this issue. In addition to this, the National Research Foundation will focus on creating a policy framework and putting in place a regulatory process that can encourage collaboration and increased spending by the private sector on research and development. Finally, the National Research Foundation will forge collaborations and participation among the industry, academia, state government departments and research institutions in research and development. Okay, these are the objectives of the National Research Foundation. See, to achieve its wide-ranging objectives, the National Research Foundation has a unique organizational structure. The Department of Science and Technology will be the administrative department of National Research Foundation. The National Research Foundation will be governed by a governing board consisting of eminent researchers and professionals across various disciplines. The governing board will have our Prime Minister as the ex-officio president and the Minister of Science and Tech and Minister of Education as the ex officio Vice Presidents. In addition to this, the National Research Foundation's functioning will be governed by an Executive Council chaired by Principal Scientific Advisor to the Government of India. Okay. 
this is all about organizational structure of national research foundation now that's all regarding this discussion in this discussion we saw some important points about the national research foundation bill that was recently approved by the union cabinet see this topic is very much important for your mains exam so make note of each and every points that we discussed now let's move on to the next news article discussion now take a look at this small article this news article states that an elephant was electrocuted in nagarhol tiger reserve this mishap happened at a private farm as the owner of the farm drew illegal power from his domestic connection to supply to his solar fence so due to this mishap an elephant was electrocuted in nagarhol tiger reserve and this is about the news article given here now in this context let us learn some important points about nagarhol tiger reserve See Nagarhol Tiger Reserve spread across the districts of Kodagu and Mysore in Karnataka. It serves as an important habitat for a diverse range of flora, fauna and indigenous tribes. The Nagarhol Tiger Reserve was initially a hunting reserve for the former rulers of Mysore. Then in the year 1955, the Nagarhol was officially established as a wildlife sanctuary. At that time it covered a few areas of the forests such as Hadgat, Arkeri and Nalkeri in Kodagu. Subsequently, the government upgraded the sanctuary into a national park by extending over an area of about 571 square kilometer in 1983. Then in the year 1986, Nagarhol National Park along with Bandipur Tiger Reserve was included as a part of the Nilgiri Biosphere Reserve. Then in 2000, in recognition of its good number of elephant population, Nagarhol National Park was included under Project Elephant. and it was constituted as a part of Mysore Elephant Reserve then in 2003 an area of 71 square kilometer was added to make it 643 square kilometer national park area in the same year nagarhol national park attained the status of tiger reserve by including nagarhol under project tiger and made it an extension of bandipur tiger reserve and later in 2007 nagarhol was declared as an independent tiger reserve by notifying around 643 square kilometer area as core or critical tiger habitat finally in 2012 the government of karnataka notified an area of about 204 square kilometer as buffer zone of narhol tiger reserve by expanding the total area of tiger reserve administration to 847 square kilometer okay this is all about the history of narhol tiger reserve now we will see about the geography of narhol tiger reserve See the Nagarhol derives its name from the winding river Nagarhol. The word Nagarhol translates to snake river in the local language. The Nagarhol river serves as a lifeline for the reserve by providing water to the diverse ecosystem that thrives within the boundary of Nagarhol Tiger Reserve. The Nagarhol river later merges with the Kabini river and this Kabini river forms the boundary between Nagarhol Tiger Reserve and Bandipur National Park. Apart from this, the Nagarhol Tiger Reserve also has a good number of streams and rivers. The Kabini and Taraka reservoirs are large water bodies located towards the western southeastern parts of Nagarhol National Park respectively. Okay? This is the geography of Nagarhol Tiger Reserve. Now moving forward, we will see the climatic condition in the Tiger Reserve. See the climate in Nagarhol Tiger Reserve is typically tropical with hot summers and moderate winters. The Tiger Reserve receives a considerable amount of rainfall during the monsoon season which contributes to the lush greeny and thriving ecosystem. See the combination of abundant rainfall and favorable temperatures creates an ideal environment for the growth of variety of vegetation. Now what about the flora and the Nagarhol Tiger Reserve? The forest type found in Nagarhol Tiger Reserve is predominantly moist deciduous and semi evergreen forests. See towering trees dense undergrowth and a canopy provides shelter to numerous species the reserve is home to a remarkable array of plant life including teak rosewood sandalwood bamboo and various other medicinal plants these diverse plant species contribute to the overall ecological balance and they provide a habitat for multitude of animals now speaking about the wildlife nagarhol tiger reserve is renowned for its rich fauna The Nagarhol Tiger Reserve hosts a significant tiger population. This makes it a vital conservation site for the tiger species. Apart from tigers, the Nagarhol Tiger Reserve is home to a plethora of other wildlife including Asian elephants, Indian bison, leopard, jungle cat, Indian pangolin, 
Asian palm civet and langurs. Apart from animals, the birds such as the Malabar grey hornbill, the Malabar trogon, blue bearded bee eater, scarlet minivet and the vibrant Indian peafowl are also seen in the Narhol Tiger Reserve. This is all about the flora and fauna. See the Narhol Tiger Reserve is not only a heaven for wildlife but it also a dwelling place for several indigenous tribes. The Jenu Kurubas are the primary inhabitants of this Narhol Tiger Reserve. In Kannada, the term Jenu means honey and the term Kuruba generally means shepherd. See, the Jenu Kurubas have a deep understanding of the forest ecosystem and they possess traditional knowledge of sustainable agricultural practices. Okay, this is all about the tribes found in Narhol Tiger Reserve. And that's all regarding this discussion. In this discussion, we saw about the history of Narhol Tiger Reserve. Then we saw about the geography of Nagarhol Tiger Reserve. Then we saw about the climatic conditions of Nagarhol Tiger Reserve. And finally, we saw some points about the flora, fauna, and tribes seen in the Nagarhol Tiger Reserve. See, this topic is very much important for your prelims exam. So make note of each and every points that we discussed. Now let's move on to the next news article discussion. Now take a look at these two articles from yesterday's newspaper. Both the articles highlight an important scheme relevant for our examination. According to the first article, on Wednesday, the Cabinet Committee on Economic Affairs have approved the PM Pranam Scheme. PM Pranam stands for PM Program for Restoration, Awareness Generation, Nourishment and Amelioration of Mother Earth Scheme. This scheme is a promise made in the last budget and it is currently approved by the Cabinet Committee on Economic Affairs. Now, according to the second news article, the Environment Ministry has issued a draft notification that explains about the proposed green credit scheme. This scheme incentivizes sustainable activities by generating green credits which can be traded for money. And this is the crux of the news articles given here. Now in this context, let us quickly go through PM Pranam and green credit schemes. Now before getting into discussion, the syllabus relevant to this topic is given here. You can go through it. Firstly, let's start with the PM Pranam scheme. See, PM Pranam is a short form of PM Program for Restoration, Awareness Generation, Nourishment and Amelioration of Mother Earth Scheme. And it is also called as PM Promotion of Alternate Nutrients for Agricultural Management Yojana. As the name itself hints, the basic objective of the scheme is to incentivize the farmers to reduce the overall consumption of fertilizers by incentivizing the states. See, we all know that to enhance the productivity of agriculture, it is necessary to administer the crops with sufficient nutrients. But over a period of time, due to subsidies on fertilizer and lack of awareness among the farmers, there has been overuse of fertilizers. This resulted in soil erosion, increase in salinity and a fall in overall productivity. So in order to reduce the usage of fertilizers and to create a proper environment, PM Pranam scheme has been launched. The PM Pranam scheme aims to reduce overall expenditure on chemical fertilizers. Remember, one of the key features of the scheme is that the funding for the scheme will come from savings made from the current fertilizer subsidy. This means that the PM Pranam scheme will not be implemented with a separate budget for fertilizer rationalization. And note that the scheme is run by the Department of Fertilizers. Now talking about the funding pattern, See, the 50% of the subsidy savings from the existing schemes will be passed to the state as a grant. The 70% of this grant can be utilized for the purpose of capacity expansion in the area of creating alternate fertilizer production units at the village, block and district levels. The remaining 30% of the grant money can be utilized for encouraging farmers, panchayats, farmer producer organizations and self-help groups that are involved in the reduction of fertilizer use and awareness generation. Okay, this is about the funding pattern. See, to check the proper implementation of the PM Pranam scheme, the government will compare annual consumption of fertilizers to consumption over the previous three years. This allows the government to find whether annual consumption has increased or decreased. And note that to track the use of fertilizers, a platform named IFMS, that is Integrated fertilizers management system is also going to be launched and that's all about PM Pranam scheme remember judicious use of fertilizer is very important not only for the economy but also from the environmental perspective so it is very important to ensure that fertilizers are 
put to effective use after taking stocks of various situations okay this is all about pm pranam scheme now moving on to see about green credit scheme see the aim of the green credit scheme is to implement a competitive market based approach for green credits in order to incentivize various environmental actions of various stakeholders here the stakeholders may include individuals industries farmers producers organizations urban local bodies gram panchayats private sectors etc the green credits will be tradable and those who are earning it will be able to put these credits up for a sale on a proposed domestic market platform if you could not understand let's break it down and we will understand how the scheme actually works see the environment ministry has identified eight select activities under the environment protection act 1986 for which the green credit can be earned the activities include tree plantation water conservation water harvesting and water use efficiency or savings promoting natural and regenerative agricultural practice waste management air pollution reduction mangrove conservation and restoration and eco mark based green credit and finally construction of buildings and other infrastructure using sustainable technology and material so doing any of these eight activities we can earn green credit okay for example an individual who undertakes tree plantation in an area can earn green credits which can then be sold at the trading platform after a steering committee has validated the green credits similarly a urban local body can earn green credit for building waste management infrastructure see each green credit will have a monetary value assigned by the committee however the entities will also be made to pay environmental compensation for violation of provisions contained in the notification the draft notification states that the environmental compensation will be collected by a gcp administrator that is green credit program administrator and the compensation will be deposited in a separate dedicated account the generated fund will then be utilized for taking measures for market stabilization along with other activities related to the implementation of green credit program that would be approved by the steering committee see the key feature of this scheme is that the trading platform will connect all players who are suppliers of green credit so if an environment conscious company or industry want to avail loan at a cheaper rate of interests for undertaking environment friendly interventions they can buy these green credits see the green credit scheme is yet to be specified mechanism so the thresholds and benchmarks will be developed for each green credit activity or process for generating and the issuance of green credit see allocation of one unit of green credit for each activity will be determined based on the achievable environmental outcome then equivalence of resource requirement parity of scale scope size and other relevant parameters the government will also develop and establish digital processes for the green credit program which include self assessment of eligible green credit activities registration of projects issuance of green credits and monitoring performance okay and that's all regarding this green credit program or green credit scheme now in this discussion we saw about pm pranam scheme and its objectives and then we saw about the green credit program and the working of green credit program see this topic is very much important for your prelims exam so make note of each and every points that we discussed now let us move on to the next news article discussion now have a look at this editorial article this article is taken from yesterday's newspaper this article is speaking about the ongoing issue between the elected delhi government and the central government regarding who has the control over civil services in new delhi now in this context let us learn about the background of the issue and about the important points provided in this news article now before getting into discussion the syllabus relevant to this topic is given here you can go through it now firstly we we'll look at the background of the issue see the current matter of contention between the elected government of new delhi and the lieutenant governor who is appointed by the union government is about the control over civil services in new delhi the delhi government stated that it is having the full control over the civil services as they were democratically elected by the people on the other hand the lieutenant governor said that the delhi is specially administered by national capital territory of delhi act 1991 so that the lieutenant governor who is appointed by the union government will have the control over civil services so earlier this matter went to the supreme court 
தென் ஆன் லெவன்த் மே டூ தௌசண்ட் டுவெண்ட்டி த்ரீ எ ஃபைவ் ஜட்ஜ் கான்ஸ்டியூஷனல் பெஞ்ச் கேவ் த வேர்டிக்ட் இன் ஃபேவர் ஆஃப் டெல்லி கவர்மெண்ட் த சுப்ரீம் கோர்ட் ரூல்டு தட் த எலக்டட் டெல்லி கவர்மெண்ட் ஹேஸ் த கண்ட்ரோல் ஓவர் சிவில் சர்வீசஸ் இன் டெல்லி வித் எக்ஸம்ஷன்ஸ் இன் த மேட்டர்ஸ் ஆஃப் பப்ளிக் ஆர்டர் போலீஸ் அண்ட் லேண்ட் சி தீஸ் த்ரீ மேட்டர்ஸ் கம்ஸ் அண்டர் த புர்வியூ ஆஃப் யூனியன் கவர்மெண்ட் டு என்ஷூர் த சேஃப்டி ஆஃப் த நேஷனல் கேபிட்டல் டெரிட்டரி ஆஃப் டெல்லி சப்சிக்வெண்ட்லி ஆன் நைன்டீன்த் மே the union government promulgated an ordinance to amend the government of national capital territory of delhi act 1991 this ordinance stripped away the delhi government's control over the civil servants by removing entry 41 of the state list that deals with public service commission the ordinance also proposes to establish national capital civil service authority to deal with matter of civil services the national capital civil service authority will consist of the chief minister of delhi the chief secretary and the principal home secretary the decisions will be taken on the basis of majority voting one important point to note here is that even if all the three members of national capital civil service authority anonymously take a stand and if the lieutenant governor takes a different stand then the decision of lieutenant governor shall prevail see the delhi government views this ordinance as an attempt by the union government to override the supreme court judgment regarding the control over civil services in delhi so because of this only currently there is a tussle between the central government and the delhi government and this is about the background of the issue now let's discuss the important points given in this article firstly the article speaks about the justification of union government regarding the control of civil services in new delhi see the union government has two justifications to defend its promulgation of ordinance the first argument of union government is that at policy level delhi unlike other states it is the national capital territory so that there should be a balance between the elector government of delhi and the union government regarding civil services so the union government says that the transferring of control of civil services to the union government should ensure a balance between ncd of delhi and the union government then the second argument of union government is that a legal perspective see article 239 aa of indian constitution authorizes the parliament to enact laws which comes under the competence of states which includes services that is as per article 239 aa of indian constitution the parliament can enact law to have a control over the civil servants so the union government said that based on this provision only it promulgated ordinance so this is about the justification of union government regarding the control of civil services see the writer of this article says that both of these justifications are not sound he also said that this ordinance is unconstitutional as it undermines the principles of democracy see the bureaucrats coordinate the day to day administration at different levels while elected representatives that as mlas and mps are responsible for the policy formulation and shaping vision so to effectively implement the policies and visions the civil servants have to be under the control of elected representatives see the supreme court also insisted this in its recent judgment on may 2023 the supreme court in its judgment came out with a concept of triple chain of accountability according to this concept the civil servants are accountable to the cabinet the cabinet is accountable to the legislature and the legislature is ultimately accountable to the electorate that is the people who elects them so any action which negatively affects the triple chain of accountability would amount to undermine the constitutional principle of democracy so the author says that the delhi ordinance is not in consistency with the triple chain of accountability concept note that article 239 aa accords special status to delhi this article also debars the elected government of delhi from legislating in three matters that is public order land and police the author opines that by already depriving the delhi government in these three matters the balance of interest between the elected delhi government and the union government is already set in article 239 aa itself apart from this the supreme court also ruled that article 239 aa does not takes away the control of delhi government over services and it also preserves the triple chain of accountability but here the delhi services ordinance affects this triple chain of accountability as it takes away the services from the delhi government apart from this the author also highlights about the provision in article 239 aa which enables the parliament to enact laws for national capital territory of delhi in the state lists also so the author says that 
this power is given to parliament to pass any legislation in case of unforeseen circumstances and it does not restrict the functioning of the elected delhi government but here the delhi service ordinance completely takes the power of elected delhi government and it hands it over to the central government which is against the constitution so the author argues that there is no concrete reason behind this ordinance as the balance of interest is already achieved within the constitution itself as the ordinance undermines the principle of representative democracy and the responsible governance the matter went to the apex court that is the supreme court for the fifth time now let us wait and see what is going to happen in the future okay and that's all regarding this discussion in this discussion we saw about the background of ongoing issue between the union government and the delhi government regarding the control of civil servants then we saw about the ordinance promulgated by union government then we saw about the union government's justifications for an ordinance and finally we saw some points about the issues with the ordinance now with these points in mind let us move on to the next news article discussion now look at this article from the text and context page this article is speaking about open market sales scheme see the food corporation of india recently notified that it had imposed quantity restrictions for private bidders and it won't allow the states to procure rice and wheat through its open market sales scheme and this is about the news now in this context let us learn what is this open market sales scheme and we will also learn about what are the new changes brought in now first we look at open market sales scheme see open market sales scheme is a part of food corporation of india's market intervention program under this scheme food corporation of india sells its surplus food grains from the central pool to traders bulk customers and retail chains at a predetermined prices this sale happens through e auction bidding which allow buyers to procure grains in specified quantities note that rice and wheat are the most prominent food grains sold under open market sales scheme apart from the private players the states can also procure food grains under this open market sales scheme without participating in e auctions note that the states can procure food grains under this scheme apart from what they get from centers share for distribution amongst the beneficiaries of national food security act the main aim of the open market sales scheme is to curb the inflation and to stabilize the rising prices of food grains this is all about the open market sales scheme now let us see about the new changes brought in by the food corporation of india see the food corporation of india released the revised policy of open market sales scheme on 13th june 2023 under this revised policy the food corporation of india has placed a cap on quantity that a single bidder can purchase in single bid earlier the maximum quantity allowed per single bid was over 3000 metric tons but the revised policy only allows to procure 10 to 100 metric tons in a single bid the rationale behind this restriction is to accommodate more small and marginal buyers so that it shall ensure the wider reach of the open market sales scheme apart from this the revised policy can also be a game changer as it tries to break the monopolies of bulk buyers meanwhile it allows more competitive bids from small buyers then the next major change brought out under the revised policy is that the food corporation of india won't sell rice and wheat to state governments under the open market sales scheme hereafter the revised policy also restricts the trade between private players who procure from open market sales scheme and the state government now that this restriction of sale is only applicable for the food grains purchased by the private players under open market sales scheme the chairman of food corporation of india said that central government is balancing the interest of eight crore beneficiaries of national food security act in one hand and the interest of 60 crore common people who are affected by the retail prices on the other hand okay this is about the new changes brought under the revised policy see the opposition accuses that there is a political motive behind this revised policy see in karnataka elections the congress party promised to give rice for marginalized families under its anna bhagya scheme now this new change will make it tough for the congress government to implement this scheme successfully while this is the case in karnataka the tamil nadu government is looking for sources other than food corporation of india to procure food grains okay and that's all regarding this discussion in this discussion we saw about open market sales scheme then we saw about the new changes brought in by the food corporation of india in the open market sales scheme 
See, this topic is very much important for your prelims exam. So, make note of each and every points that we discussed. Now, let's move on to the next news article discussion. Now, look at this article from the text and context page. See, recently on 20th June, the election commission released a draft proposal on the delimitation of assembly and Lok Sabha constituencies in Assam. So, this text and context article is written in that context only. Now, in our discussion, today we will see what is delimitation and we will also see the issues with the draft proposal. Now, let's start with delimitation. Now, what does the term delimitation mean? Delimitation is the process of redrawing of boundaries of Lok Sabha and State Assembly constituencies. It is mainly done to ensure that each seat has an almost equal number of voters. Normally, delimitation is done based on recent census. Delimitation in India is done by the Delimitation Commission which is formed under the provisions of Delimitation Commission Act. Now, why is the delimitation exercise done in Assam? To get to the answer for this question, we must know a little bit of history. See, delimitation exercise in India was carried out in 1952, 1962 and 1972. In 1976, the exercise was suspended due to the family planning program started by the government. And during the recent 2008 exercise, delimitation was not conducted in the states of Arunachal Pradesh, Assam, Jammu and Kashmir, Manipur and Nahaland due to security risks. So, after the NRC was created for Assam, the Election Commission notified the initiation of Assam's delimitation on December 27, 2022. Now, what are the important features of the draft proposal? See, the number of assembly and parliamentary seats of Assam remains unchanged at 126 and 14. Of the 126 assembly seats, 24 assembly seats would be reshaped and renamed. In addition to this, the number of reserved seats in the assembly for the scheduled tribes and scheduled castes would be increased from 16 to 19 and 8 to 9 respectively. The seats that are to be reserved for the SC and ST are also to be changed. In the case of Lok Sabha, the number of reserved Lok Sabha seats, that is 2 for ST and 1 for SC would remain the same. But the Silchar constituency would become reserved for SCs in place of Karim Ganj. This is the important features of draft proposal of Assam delimitation. Now finally, let us see the issues with the draft proposal. Firstly, the ethnic groups such as Agums are disappointed with the number of assembly seats reduced from Eastern Assam and increased in Western Assam. Secondly, the delimitation exercise used the 2001 census data instead of 2011 census data. The recent delimitation exercise in Jammu and Kashmir used the 2011 census data due to which the number of seats increased. But here, as the 2001 census data was used, the number of seats did not witness a change. Lastly, there is the issue of gerrymandering. See, gerrymandering is the process of manipulating the boundaries of an electoral constituency so as to favor one party or class. Here, some political parties have raised the allegation that some seats have been reshaped to scatter the Muslim voters by reducing their representation in assembly and parliamentary seats. Okay, so these are some of the issues associated with the draft proposal of election commission. Now, with these points in mind, let us move on to the next part of the news article discussion that is to discuss preliminary practice questions. Now, look at this first question. This first question is about National Research Foundation. Now, look at the first statement. It is a statutory body. See, this statement is correct. The proposed National Research Foundation is going to be a statutory body which is to be established under National Research Foundation Bill 2023. So, statement one is correct. Now, coming to the second statement, the funding for the National Research Foundation will provide entirely by the central government. See, this statement is incorrect. As we saw in the discussion, the funding will be provided by central government, industrialists and by subsuming science and engineering research board. So, the second statement is incorrect. Now, coming to the third statement, Minister of Science and Tech is the ex officio president. See, this statement is incorrect. As we saw in the discussion, the Prime Minister is the ex officio president of National Research Foundation. So, third statement is incorrect. The question asks that how many of the given statements are correct? Here, only one statement is correct. So, the correct answer is option A, only one. Moving on, let's take up the second question. This question is regarding delimitation commission. Look at the first statement. It is a statutory body constituted as per delimitation commission act. See, this statement is correct. The delimitation commission is constituted as per delimitation commission acts. So, statement one is correct. Now, coming to the second statement, the delimitation commission is appointed by the election commission of India. 
See, this statement is incorrect. The delimitation commission is appointed by the president and not by election commission of India. So, second statement is incorrect. Now, coming to the third statement, the orders of the delimitation commission cannot be challenged in a court of law. See, this statement is correct. The orders or recommendations of delimitation commission cannot be challenged in a court of law. Now, coming to the fourth statement, when the orders of the delimitation commission are laid before the Lok Sabha or state legislative assembly, they cannot affect any modifications in the orders. See, this statement is also correct. The orders of delimitation commission cannot be modified. So, fourth statement is also correct. The question asks, how many of the statements given are correct? Here, second statement alone is incorrect and the three other statements are correct. So, the correct answer is option C, only three. Moving on, let's take up the final question. This is a statement based question. This question is about open market sales scheme. Here, two statements are given. First, we have to identify whether both the statements are correct or not. And we also need to check whether the second statement is the correct explanation of statement 1 or not. Now first we will check whether both the statements are correct or not and we will use our because or so trick. Statement 1, it aims to reduce the inflation and stabilize the rising price of food grains. See this statement is correct as we saw in the discussion, the open market sales scheme of Food Corporation of India aims to reduce inflation and it aims to stabilize the rising price of food grains. So statement 1 is correct. Now coming to the statement 2, it is a part of Food Corporation of India's market intervention program. See this statement is also correct. As we saw in the discussion, open market sales scheme is a market intervention program of FCI. So statement 2 is also correct. Now we have identified both the statements are correct. Now we have to check whether the second statement is the correct explanation of statement 1 or not. Now we will apply our because trick. Now we will add because at the end of statement 1 and we will keep reading statement 2. If it makes sense, the statement 2 is the correct explanation of statement 1. I will read, it aims to reduce the inflation and stabilize the rising price of food grains because it is a FCI's market intervention program. Does it make sense? Yes. Open market sales scheme is a market intervention program that aims to reduce inflation and it will stabilize the rising price of food grains. So the correct answer is option A, both statement 1 and statement 2 are correct and statement 2 is the correct explanation for statement 1. This is a quiz question for you today. I will post this quiz question in a community section. Try to answer it. And don't worry, the answer for the quiz question is posted in the comment section of the quiz question itself. You can verify the answer. And displayed here are the main questions for your practice. Go through the questions, write your answers and post it in the comment section. With this, we have come to the end of the video. If you liked our analysis, please like, comment and share. And don't forget to subscribe to Shankarai's Academy YouTube channel. Thank you for listening.